Hello everyone and welcome to the History Hotline, the hottest line for all things black history and beyond. Hello everyone and welcome to episode 65 of the History Hotline. My name is Deanna Lynn Cook and I will be your host today as always. Now, carrying on the theme of thinking about Caribbean people in the United States in the 20th century. Um, I didn't think this would be a series when I started it, but it, it kind of is. So if you haven't already, listen back to episode 63 and 64, um, as this is a continuation. You can listen to this one on its own. It stands alone perfectly fine, as do all podcast episodes on this platform. Um, But however, I would say just to get the context, which I love the context. I just need people to know that historically nothing happens in isolation. Everything is as a result of something that's happened before. Um, And there's no exception with this um, kind of thread of Caribbean people migrating to Britain in migrating to the US even. Wow, I'm so used to talking about Britain. Um, But essentially, if you haven't listened back, listen. But if you don't want to and you're already here and you're intrigued, stay tuned. Now, today's episode will focus on the latter half of the 20th century. Um, So the late 1940s, 50s, 60s into the civil rights movement and kind of time period and I want to leave us at the kind of cusp of the civil rights movement um the 60s because next week's episode will look at some of the key figures that are really important in the civil rights movement that have come from the Caribbean or have parents or have Caribbean heritage and background and so we're going to be talking about the impact of the 1952 Immigration and Nationality Act Um, and thinking about what that did to migration, um, the countries that people were coming from in the latter half of this um, century, um, and also um, segregation and the way that impacted Caribbean people in a different way to African-American people with um, a cool little case study as well. So during the Great Depression, migration out of the Caribbean broadly decreased, which is obviously understandable. The Great Depression was um, at the end of the 1920s, 1929, and spanned into the 30s. Um, America struggled to kind of feed and, you know, give jobs to certain Americans that were living in certain states. Um, If you've heard of the Dust Bowl states, Texas, New Mexico, Colorado, Nebraska, Kansas, and Oklahoma, during the 30s, saw about 2.5 million people leave migrating um, up north towards California in order to find work um, and kind of get themselves out of the like extreme poverty they were faced in because crops were failing and they could not work as agricultural laborers and work their land um, you know they face discrimination once they move north um, poor wages medial, menial labor um, and they lived in kind of shanty town slum areas um, on the irrigation ditches Um, that's a little bit of American history for you. There's a lot of great novels written about that time. Um, The Grapes of Wrath being one of them. Um, and when we think about that and the fact that, you know, American people born and raised, um, for generations there were struggling to migrate and were actually facing discrimination in, in places like California when they moved, um, because everybody was so fraught in finding work. Um, the fact that then there were people potentially coming from overseas, that was just not going to happen. It was not going to work. Um, So as you can imagine, some restrictive immigration laws came into place um, and countries like Haiti, Jamaica and Barbados actually saw immigrants returning to the Caribbean under repatriation programmes. And these programmes obviously would have supported their movement back to the Caribbean. Now, I don't know how widespread they were. I just know that they existed. Um, definitely something for me to look into further. I thought it worth mentioning the impact of the Great Depression um, on migration into America. Now, after the Depression and then World War II, uh, America's economy expanded from the post-war boom. The 1940s then saw increased migrations to the US um, from the Caribbean in the same way that Britain did um, after World War II. Now, um, war is a weird thing. I always find it very interesting that war can really change um, economies based on the um, military industrial complexes that they create. And um, if you are a country that's producing arms that are needed during war, 
and you will be successful economically afterwards. You would have provided jobs for people during the time, people that wouldn't normally be employed, um, most notably women. Um, that happened a lot in Britain and actually was one of their claims for getting the vote when they did because of their um, war effort and what they'd done during the war. It was then said that you know they'd shown themselves to be responsible amongst many other political, social, economic factors. Um, but I always find it very interesting what war can cause um, of course, outside of the like destruction, suffering, death, um, also the opportunities for different groups of people. Now, World War Two, in terms of the Caribbean and thinking about Britain, it saw many men and women um, joining the service um, and becoming service men and women, um, whether that be in the RAF, the Navy, the Women's Auxiliary Territorial Services. Um, and based on the skills that they developed during wartime, they were able to migrate to Britain afterwards, um, having had a bit of an understanding and an experience of Britain. Now, a similar thing happened because there were Caribbean soldiers stationed all around America during World War Two as well. Um, most notably, actually, um, a lot of the women from the Auxiliary Territorial Service went via America to Britain um, to train and also to spend time there in service there. So um, it's quite interesting that some people then would have decided instead of migrating to Britain, which was their quote-unquote motherland, they would go to America. Um, we've mentioned before, geographically, it's a closer option and they might have just seen that as a place that had more opportunities. Um, the things with the Caribbean, and I think I've said it before, is migration is not uncommon there, whether it be migration from Caribbean island to Caribbean island or Caribbean country, not all of them are islands, um, or migration completely out of um, that region. It is very common, and I think the Caribbean is literally born out of migrations, whether you think about the original inhabitants, um, the Arawaks, who came from South America, who then set up shop, shall we say, in the Caribbean, in islands like Jamaica, um, and then the Europeans that migrated there afterwards, and then the... Um, enslaved African people that were forced to migrate there and live there afterwards. So if you think about the Caribbean, most of those countries were not inhabited by anyone or anything um, prior to the first people to settle there, the indigenous populations. Um, so definitely something to think about when we're thinking about the Caribbean. People were moving out of the Caribbean, not just to America or Britain. Um, in the 1950s and 60s, it was said to have been around 6,000 to 8,000 workers per year that left from Martinique and Guadeloupe and migrated to France. They were Caribbean islands that were um, colonised by the French. Um, and then around 100,000 Surinamese um, people moved to the Netherlands between 1966 and 1975. Again, an island colonised by the Netherlands um, and... 295,000 Puerto Ricans moved to the US in around 1950 um, and as mentioned 200,000 to 250,000 um, people from the Caribbean moved to Britain between 1948 and 1964 which we know all too well. Um, around 50,000 um, Caribbean nationals migrated to the US between 41 and 50 so that's only nine years. Um, Britain saw 250,000 move between 48 and 64, which is obviously a lot longer um, of a time period. Um, but, you know, people were moving is the point of this. And in total, over 4 million people left the Caribbean between 1950 and 1980. So the dates I've given you there, we've, we've looked at the 40s, 50s and 60s. Um, and that 4 million number is from 1950 to 1980. Um, so you can imagine there is a lot of a lot of people moving um, and migration isn't it's not a big deal in the Caribbean is what I'm trying to say. I think, um, you know, whilst we look at people moving to Britain, which was a big deal because it was kind of the first of its kind and it was so far away. Um, but people in Martinique and Guadeloupe were going all the way to France. Um, do you know what I mean? So it's yeah, not a big deal, but it's a big deal. Um, because historically it means a lot and it sets the tone for certain things and race relations and all that stuff. But um, my point is that it, it was something that was happening all over the Caribbean um, to many different parts of the world. And then in 1952, there was yet another Immigration Act. My favourite thing to think about is Immigration Acts. The 1952 Immigration and Nationality Act, also known as the McCarran-Walter Act, um, which changed the quota system um, that America had. Um, and it attempted to reform immigration laws 
um, because there were criticisms that were really kind of dampening US um, international relations with other countries because their country were not allowed to migrate into the US in numbers that they might have liked. And so this act kept those kind of quotas in the quota system. Um, however, it also granted quotas to countries that didn't have any quotas before. And those quotas were most notably Asian countries um, and countries in Africa. Um, and it removed the racial restrictions on citizenship by naturalization. Um, this was kind of seen as like a symbolic gesture. Um, what's significant, still symbolic, um, because 85% of immigration quotas were allocated to Western and Northern Europeans, while Asian countries, in kind of comparison, had really small quotas, um, as did Eastern European countries. Um, and Japan probably had the largest quota, and it was like 185. Um, Asian migration was seen as a kind of I guess it was, a, now we look back at it, it was the problematic thing about this act because it was the only like population group, um, Asian people, that were tracked by race. And their overall cap was 2,000 per year um, by the Asian Pacific Triangle restriction. So every other quota was given to a country. So it didn't matter what colour you were. It was, if you were coming as a British citizen from Britain, that was a quota for that. If you were coming as... A Kenyan citizen from Kenya, that was a quota from that. It didn't matter if you were of, you know, black, white or Asian background. Whereas when it came to Asian countries, they weren't tracked by country per se. Um, there was this Asian Pacific Triangle restriction, which was capped at 2000. Um, and I think assuming if Japan had 185 people, it was like broken down um, into each country. Um, and so this was seen as very problematic at the time. Obviously, looking back, it still is. It most definitely is, um, especially in the kind of context of the Cold War that was happening um, alongside at this time in the 50s. Um, there was a lot of tensions with the Soviet Union, with China um, and the US, Britain, France and, and those kind of allies on that side of the world. So the law remained discriminatory, let's be honest, um, in the eyes of many. Um and actually, President Harry Truman vetoed the law um, because, actually, and interestingly, um, the limited provisions it gave for refugees. However, Congress overturned it um, and it went through anyway. Um, so it's interesting there, the division of, of what the president wanted and what Congress wanted. Um, so this law goes in and this um, means that for our Caribbean people that we're thinking about today, um, migrants from the British colonies were no longer included in the British quota. Um, each, like Jamaica got a, a quota, Trinidad got a quota, Guyana got a quota, for example. Um, but it meant that they were limited to only maybe 100 um, visas annually, which was down from 1,000 during the 1940s. Um, so essentially, this is restricting immigration. Let's Shall we say that? For... <laughs> Um, Asian people and for black people, but in different ways for each each type of person. Um, historians, some historians would say the act is racist. As I've said, it's been seen as discriminatory and problematic, and I would probably agree um, because it reduced the influx mostly of, of Asian immigrants um, and black Caribbean immigrants um, and black African immigrants, um, even though they would have been allowed to move to Britain because under the 1948 um, Nationality Act that meant that they were now citizens of Britain um, and so this is where we kind of see a shift of people moving to Britain in much larger numbers than they do to America because it's even though it's geographically closer and probably easier to move to America legally um, visa wise it's way easier to move to Britain um, and this is where we see this shift, which is quite interesting because before that, the large numbers of um, people from the Caribbean migrating were into America, not to Britain at all, um, pre-war and pre this 1952 Immigration Act. Um, so, yeah, I find that act interesting because it's not, it's very, um, should we say it's very blunt in its racism because it's literally saying we're going to make these numbers smaller for the black people and Asian people coming, but people from um, Western Europe, Northern Europe, you're free to move. Um, even though, technically speaking, Western and Northern Europe, they had colonies in all these countries, in all these um, continents and areas 
um, and the people were citizens of that country. So Jamaicans are still British citizens, um, and I'm calling them Jamaicans because that's where they're born, um, but they're still British citizens because of the Nationality Act, but can't move to Jam- America as a British citizen. They are moving under their colony quota, um, if that makes sense. I really hope it does. Um, but essentially, um, seen as discriminatory, seen as racist, I would agree. Um, and also, it did mean that a majority of the people migrating would have already had to have relatives or family residing in the US. And the majority of these people were in New York, as we've mentioned in the past episode. Um, So that act also had a clause in it that um, you could move to join a family. Um, The act was said to be trying to unify families that were split up otherwise because of migration. So, for example, if a father had moved prior to the US, his children could now move, um, and his wife, for example, and his family... um, in order to unify families in America, which is interesting. Um, But it meant that people that already had connections to the US would have been the ones that were easy, easily able to move, um, as opposed to people that had no link there already. But as I've mentioned before, immigration continued to grow. um, And people were still moving from different parts of the Caribbean um, into America. Now, notably, um, the Cubans were moving and immigration um from cuba i think was very notable because of the bay of pigs um episode and the cuban revolution that happened in 1959 that as you probably can imagine needs a whole series of episodes um to actually get into but people were migrating from um cuba to florida so so close you could literally you could probably just fly i mean if we had wings you you could just like you could jump you could long jump over the waters from um cuba to florida um i am joking but it is very close it's probably the closest i think the closest caribbean island to american state i'm gonna check that hope the tension didn't kill you but i was wrong in fact havana to key west is very close um, Key West being in Florida, like right at the bottom, um, and Havana being kind of at the, the top middle of Cuba. However, there is a really, 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 really small island called Bimini, which is even closer to Florida, and the Bahamas are actually also closer um, on the never e- eastern side of Florida. Because um, obviously Florida like has this really long, kind of long <laughs> horizontal part that's in the sea that goes above Cuba um but is west of the Bahamas I am really bad at geography I'm so sorry but I really needed to you to know that um it's very close and you can just get a boat um or a short flight um Bimini has an airport as well um I've learned so much today um, about these smaller islands I wonder I wonder what Bimini's like I'm gonna do some research on that later if anybody is from there then hello how do you do And if anyone's ever been there, then please let me know. I'd love to know more about this intriguing place I've just found. Just a disclaimer here, Havana is not in the middle of Cuba at all. Um, Please ignore me. I have a map in front of me and I'm still getting it wrong. So just ignore that whole section of geography. I promise to never, ever, ever, ever try and speak about anything geographical ever again on this podcast. My apologies. (laughs) Anyway, back to the history and migration, things I know something about. Um, So... As I said, migration was increasing. Um, Immigrants from Jamaica, for example, increased from 9,000 to approximately 75,000 over this really big time period of the late 20th century. Um, Places like New York, New Jersey, Connecticut grew significant Caribbean communities, um, expanding the Caribbean professional and business communities there. Um, And this was kind of all the way up to 1970, as we've mentioned before, New York being a key place for these migrations. It continues to be so. Um, And, you know, on the eastern side of America, I know I said I wouldn't be doing any more geography, but I know that New Jersey, Connecticut, New York are all sort of close to each other um, on the east coast. I know that much. Um, So those areas were growing um, in numbers. Um, And this kind of takes us nicely up to a point of civil rights and segregation. Um, I say nicely, they weren't nice things, but it was a nice lead up. So some migrants settled in the south 
most notably Bahamians um, in Florida. As I said, maybe the geography's paying off. It's super close. The Bahamas is so close to Florida. It really is. No lie. Um, and so they would have um, migrated there. However, the South, civil rights, segregation, Jim Crow, not good, racism. Um, and so they would have been exposed um, and traumatised by racism and the atrocities that were um, a result of racism in states like Florida um, and maybe less so in, in some of the northern states. Um, now, many historians have noted that it is black people, obviously, who faced racism. Um, but black people from the Caribbean are racialized in a different way. But you can't tell a black person is from the Caribbean and not African-American unless maybe by the dress sense, which we spoke about last episode, or when they open their mouth and you hear an accent, um, or maybe the way they carry themselves, you know, if you're really that astute. So they tended to receive better treatment than African-Americans. Um, it was just a fact. Also, um, people from the Caribbean, whilst in the, the last episode we did speak kind of specifically about Afro-Caribbean, so black people of African descent, there were people of um, Asian descent coming from the Caribbean. There would have been people that were mixed race um, in different proportions um, and so might have been benefited from being lighter skinned um, and being privileged in that sense um, as well. So I think it's an interesting point to pick up on and we've spoken about it a lot in the last episode, but in the context of the early 20th century, um, when we think about civil rights and actual segregation, where legally you are not allowed to drink from the same water fountain, sit on the same bench, enter in the same public door in a building, you know, this this becomes this is going to impact your everyday life um, more so than it would have done in the 20 in the early 20th century when um, civil rights laws and segregation wasn't entrenched into the law as it was in the time period I'm going to talk about for this case study. So an interesting story um, of a man called Colin Powell who was born in Harlem, New York in 1937. His parents Luther and Maud Powell were immigrants from Jamaica um, and while he was still young, his family moved to the South Bronx, um, which is another neighbourhood in New York City, which was very much another um, heavily influenced Caribbean part of New York. Um, I saw a lot of Caribbean people, notably Jamaicans, moving to the Bronx. Um, I have a lot of family that moved to the Bronx from Jamaica um, and grew up and, and lived there. So he, um, Colin, that is, uh, went to school, average C grade student, apparently. He spent too much time joking about when he was in school, but... After graduating from high school, he went to City College of New York um, and ended up after that joining the military. Um, and his first job was to attend basic training at Fort Benning in Georgia. Now, Colin is um, the descendant of Jamaicans. He's a black man navigating New York, very different to then navigating Georgia. Um, he served in the Vietnam War and it's what he's kind of most known for. Um, but when he was at basic training in Fort Benning, it was where he first encountered segregation, um, black and white people having different schools, restaurants, bathrooms. Um, you've seen the imagery of that, um, which is obviously very different to New York City. Um, however, the army um, wasn't segregated. Um, so in Powell's eyes anyway, he was just another soldier. He had something to do. He had a purpose. Um, and um, he was going to do that. Now, Interestingly enough, when he was um, in Fort Benning, there was a white waitress in the restaurant he attended um, and he was asked kind of out, outright if he was a foreigner. He wasn't assumed to be African-American. He was asked to be a foreigner because if he was a foreigner, he was allowed to be served in that segregated restaurant because he wasn't African-American. But if he was African-American or quote unquote Negro American, as the term is used um, in the source I'm reading, um, he was to be refused service. And interestingly enough, he said he was um, Negro American um, and he was refused service and he wasn't allowed to eat in that restaurant. So as simple as you identifying as a quote unquote foreigner, Caribbean, um, and being um, Negro American, and I'm not sure if he said he was Negro American because he was born in America and 
technically speaking, that's what he would be. He's, he wasn't an immigrant himself, his parents were. Or in kind of solidarity with what black people were going through. I'm not sure. Um, it isn't really explored um, in this source. But I just thought it was very interesting that people actually making that distinction, um, I didn't I didn't know, didn't realise um, that the treatment would have been so different as to being in a restaurant that's segregated and then being refused service. Um, or, or if he'd said he was an, a foreigner, would he have had a nice meal? Um, very, very interesting. And it, I think for me, it just shows how ridiculous it all is, which we know um, racism for the most part is, is very ridiculous um, in most instances and cases. In other cases, it's just insidious and disgusting. But this segregation and, and Jim Crow, it, it, it really reads to me as ridiculous. Um, and that's not to like simplify it or to dumb it down in any way. But yeah, Colin Powell has this experience and I think it kind of perfectly emphasises what was going on um, in the South compared to the North um, and in America at that time. And I don't want to oversimplify all these histories. I'm, I'm saying a lot of general statements um, and generalisations can be made. But, you know, racism was happening in the North. Yes, there wasn't formal segregation in Jim Crow, um, but things weren't peachy everywhere at all. Um, so at the end of the day... Whilst they were treated differently, the experiences would have been very different because, as you are aware, um, if you move somewhere, if you're an immigrant, if you're the new person in a town or a country, you're going to have a hard transition potentially. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that just because you were treated better than African-Americans, you know, it was all peaches and roses. Um, however, this did lead to Caribbean people mobilising and joining movements for race equality, um, across the US. Situations like this, um, them seeing how African Americans were treated and also African Americans um, kind of eventually banding together and, and bringing, not bringing Caribbean people into the cause, but there just being a bit, a bit more unity than maybe we saw um, in the early 20th century where people were moving and were new. It was kind of a new thing for Caribbean people to be moving and creating communities and being there in such high, high numbers um, after slavery. Because when you think about it, Slavery actually was only abolished in America in 1865. Um, and then you, it's literally like, what, 40 years later, um, we'd have the turn of the, the 20th century and these migrations start. So, um, but yeah, it's a very transformative time period, I would say, the 20th century. Uh, it's my favourite period of history to study across the world. I love 20th century history. I don't really... I know it's not that long ago, <laughs> which people say it's not real history, but I say it is. Yeah. Anyway, so next week's episode, the final one in this little series, we're going to look at people like Stokely Carmichael, who comes from Trinidad and is a key figure in the civil rights movement, Kwame Ture, um, as he would rather be known, um, Malcolm X, father being from Grenada. Uh, we're going to look at Sidney Potier, who um, was accidentally born in Miami, um, but is from the Bahamas and grew up there. Um, and just people that contributed to America during the kind of 60s, 70s and 80s. Um, so I hope you have enjoyed this episode and I hope that you will be joining me next week to find out a little bit more about Caribbean people in America. Then we're going to jump on a plane um, or we're going to do a little um, long jump over the water back to Britain um, and think about some more instances of black British history. I've missed it. Um, I think we need to come back soon. So thank you so much for listening. Have a wonderful week. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to the History Hotline. If you've enjoyed this episode, please tell a friend to tell a friend. To continue the conversation about black history, head over to our social media platforms at the History Hotline on Instagram and at the History HL on Twitter.